Venezuela is a little obscure from an Indian point of view. It's uh, pretty far out there. And uh, to talk about those uh, issues there and uh, their relevance to India, I have with me Smita Prashottam. She was ambassador to Venezuela until fairly recently. Uh, in fact, she demitted office, I think, sometime in 2015 or 2016. Uh, ambassador yeah. Prashottam, uh, how would you, um, exactly what is going on in Venezuela? Can you break it down for us? Okay, thank you very much for, for inviting me for this interview. Uh, well, the crisis in Venezuela has uh, uh, has quite a has been of a long duration, and uh, I was witness to some of it unfolding during my my uh, my tenure there. Well, the crisis has multiple dimensions, and uh, these extend from economic to political to a crisis of legitimacy now, as you you are witnessing. Uh, I'll start with the economic because people think it's of recent origin this crisis, but it began even under under President Chavez. He had uh, a socialist philosophy and uh, he wanted to promote socialism. Unfortunately, in doing so, he actually destroyed the basis of genuine socialism because what what we understand as socialism or communism is uh, the dictatorship of the proletariat, you know, industry growth, etc. But he nationalized industry, he nationalized agriculture, and basically the output there declined, and those two sectors were in crisis for uh, for, for quite some time. And so uh, we used to not call it a dictatorship of the proletariat, we used to call it the dictatorship of the petrolariat, to the great amusement of my reporting officer in Delhi, in MEA. So uh, uh, the, the, the diversity of the Venezuelan economy, which was a fairly diversified uh, uh, economy, uh, was restricted, constrained, and the export basket became totally reliant on oil, oil exports only. Now, how was he able to carry on? And in fact, he was an extremely charismatic and popular leader because the oil revenues had shot up in the first decade of the century. They'd gone up to even $108 per barrel, as you would recall. So um, he was able to fund social welfare programs, uh, health programs, education programs, and um, get a lot of public support and popularity as a result. But uh, only a small fraction of the petrol dollars were really going into into these these sectors, and uh, the large bulk of it was unaccounted for. Now, another thing which complicated the economic situation was the dual exchange rate, which they had implemented in 2000 as early as 2003. Now, uh, this exchange rate uh, duality meant that you know large sections of the bureaucracy could profit from this uh, from the currency arbitrage and this led to of course complications corruption very high prices for those who were paying at the official rate and so on and now i believe the official rate is 300 million per dollar which is now completely i mean it's surreal it was bad when i was there but it's surreal now so the economy was in decline in great crisis there were shortages um, around 2014, I started noticing that people were queuing up at around 4 a.m. for goods. There was such a huge shortage of goods. Now, please remember that Venezuela was a highly prosperous country before, and it was uh, one of the most developed states in every in every parameter. A very sophisticated cultural elite, excellent educational institutions, um, uh, as I said, a diversified economy, etc. So uh, this was a very unfortunate thing. Now, the other dimension of the crisis was sheer violence. Again, we should remember that Venezuela was never a narco state and it was uh, never, um, I mean, a banana republic prone to that kind of violence. So this violence was endemic. It was all around us. Diplomats were not excluded. The Mexican ambassador and his wife were kidnapped within a month of my arrival. And it went on. I will not go into the details because every day some tragic news used to come off. People we knew in our social circle or in uh, well, once removed, people were dying constantly. The other thing was uh, the violence unleashed on the students. There were lots of protests when I was there. And in the morning, we used to cross Altamira to the main square in Caracas to go to the embassy. And young people would be lining up, pleading for moral support for their cause. And uh, then uh, in the, by the evening, they were dispersed with bullets and tear gas. And I, I was just so thankful that I, I was Indian and that this sort of situation I could not imagine in India, basically. So violence, then repression, then economic mayhem, and then the crisis of legitimacy, which uh, we started with the de-recognition, de essential de-recognition of the popularly elected National Assembly. Currently, President Maduro, is he a legitimately elected leader or has he 
you know, kind of stayed on and, uh, you know, as the pattern we've seen in so many countries? Well, you know, when the state controls everything, these these uh, things become a little difficult to define. For example, the National Assembly, as I just said, it came in with the majority of the vote, uh, overwhelming majority of the vote. And he promptly then sidelined it by creating the cons so-called Constituent Assembly, which has taken over its functions. In fact, briefly, uh, the Supreme Court of Venezuela also tried to take over these functions, but there was an international outcry. Then there were presidential elections, which he won. But uh, uh, according to, uh, I'm a little out of touch, but according to the reports that I have been following, uh, there was a lot of there were a lot of questions raised as to you know rigging and other other issues um, pertaining to that election in a genuinely democratic polity he would be working with the opposition with the national assembly i mean in in, in the united states for example there's a president you know the congress may be uh, controlled by another party but they still do end up working together but this is not the situation in venezuela and uh, what would you describe as uh, president maduro's mainstay right now is it the Military? Yes, it's the military, it's the oil revenues, it's all of officialdom because even when I was there, we were looking for a particular uh, medicine um, and we found that, of course, the officials, the military, etc., all had access to it, but nobody else had. So again, in a socialist country, you, you, you can't have that situation when you know, only the elite has access to survival drugs. So yes, I mean, the elite is completely united you know, behind him. So it seems, although there are reports of the National Guard having uh, having uh, revolted, uh, part of the National Guard having revolted recently. Mm -hmm. This gentleman, uh, the opposition leader, Juan Guaido, who's mm -hmm. been recognized by President uh, Trump, uh, who's this guy? Where does he come from? Uh, well, he has uh, he was involved in one of the opposition parties, Popular Will, and he was being mentored by Leopoldo Lopez. So he's been in politics for quite some time, uh, not very prominently as a leader because other people were on the on the on the leadership stage at the time when I was there. But Leopoldo Lopez, who is his mentor, is extremely popular. He's under house arrest, and uh, uh, um, that lends some legitimacy. Besides, he's the president of the National Assembly. Guado is the president of the National Assembly, and the recognition by not just the United States, but by Canada, by the Lima group of uh, Latin American countries, does give an added dimension to his claims for legitimacy. So by if President Trump recognizes him, uh, what would you as a diplomat say? Is this some signal he's sending, perhaps intervention of some kind? No, uh, I, firstly, I'm no longer a diplomat. I'm now uh, comfortably into retirement. So these are my views, not the views of the government as a diplomat. Uh, but uh, no, I think that basically uh, it is a genuine response to hu humanitarian crisis, I would say, and the, and the, uh, the uh, which has devolved completely out of proportion. It has fallen off a cliff, I would say, with millions actually exiting Venezuela. So uh, uh, I don't think it's the precursor to an intervention as yet for the following reasons. Although I would qualify that because if the situation goes out of control, and it uh, proceeds in a different direction. One can't completely prejudge the outcome. Uh, the first is that President Trump has on many occasions himself said that he's averse to external military engagements. And uh, this follows the realist school of international politics and uh, uh, it limits the, the exposure of the United States to conflicts in which it doesn't have a direct interest. Of course, it does have direct interests in Venezuela, but anyway. Um, the second thing is that there is a huge sensitivity in Latin America to uh, external involvement, especially American involvement. So uh, the Americans would be really very careful before they take any such uh, step. Mm -hmm. What about the regional grouping, the Organization of American States? Is there any move to discuss this, any move to uh, try and uh, resolve issues? Uh, I am not aware of what they have uh, been doing. I mean, they have diversity of states, some of which support Venezuela, others which, uh, most of them which don't. So they formed a Lima group now, and that is the one which has recognized the interim president, Guado. And uh, um, uh, I'm sure the OS will be apprised of the situation and will convene to discuss, but in the past it has not been effective. So uh, we, uh, I don't expect that, you know, it, its intervention will have um, different kind of impact today.
So do you expect uh, the opposition leader to gain traction uh, going forward? Um, um, some kind of political uh, basis, uh, kind of consensus building up around him? Yes, uh, uh, the sheer turnout, uh, I just called a friend in the morning and uh, he said that uh, 3 million people out of a population of 7 turned up for an opposition rally that he addressed. So that shows enormous uh, well, if not just support for him, but as a figurehead of the of the of the of the distress that the Venezuelan people are feeling, uh, I think there's a strong possibility that now this it will be formalized. The Lima Group has issued a very interesting declaration in which they have said that uh, the the the, the, pres the Italian president should work towards democracy, towards restoration of peace, towards dialogue, and uh, basically anointed him. So uh, it's a little early right now, perhaps, to uh, to predict what's going to happen. The regime has been known to crush uh, the opposition in the past. Many such protests have happened, some in front of my eyes while I was there. But uh, uh, they, they've ruthlessly used the military against the students, against uh, the opposition. And uh, they, they have not touched the leaders as yet. So there is hope for, I hope, for dialogue. And uh, Guaido has done something very, uh, very uh, prescient. I don't know how to pronounce that word too well, but anyway, uh, he has said that he would be ready to uh, consider giving safe passage, you know, to the old regime. Again, it may be a little premature because the earlier responses of the regime have been very, very, uh, I mean, military. They've been military, basically, using military force against its own people. So let us see where it goes. I, I cannot I cannot pretend to know where it's going to go, given the unfortunate uh, developments as I have witnessed them. Now, the MEA has issued a statement on Venezuela. It's on the usual lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you were ambassador there. Um, what is it between India and Venezuela? I mean... Uh, is Venezuela on the margins of India's foreign policy? Is there something something else deeper here? No, it's not at all. It's very simple, actually. We have some investments in Venezuela in the oil fields, which are not paying as they should. Uh, but uh, we have also, apparently, we, they are still the fourth largest exporter of oil to India. But I was looking at the figures, and, uh, and uh, in my time, it used to be between 16 million to 20 million barrels per, uh, per, per year. Today, it's about 5.8. Mm -hmm. So there's a massive drop. And, uh, and uh, they may still be the fourth largest, but I, I do believe because our main importers are private, are private operators in India. So I think they must be very much aware, and they are not fools, they know what's going on. They must be restructuring their operations and their import uh, options and slowly reducing their imports from, from that country. So how would India look at the situation in Venezuela? I think first and foremost, it has to be uh, aware that, uh, that uh, you know, it cannot completely side on the right of the wrong. I mean, on the side of the wrong. I think there should be a principled response on this issue. Um, and uh, right now we are saying that it is up to the Venezuelans to sort this out peacefully, which is unexceptional. And of course, I think it's also the duty of the regional uh, reg of the region, of the regional countries and of that hemisphere to sort this problem out. It's not an immediate issue for us. And uh, in the in the good old uh, school of real uh, politics, we should uh, be uh, a little cognizant of our own interests. And the second priority, I think, should be to secure our assets there and our people. We should not expose our people to any kind of danger. If necessary, because of this crisis, we should even, I think, consider moving them out. And then perhaps we can take a call on what we need to do. Is there a large Indian diaspora there? No, we were never very uh, prolific in Venezuela, but it has dwindled over the years. There were 200 prominent families before I came, and there were about 20 when I left, so I was in the course of that. But, but uh, it is, um, yeah, Indians have been leaving and there's really, it's impossible to do business there. People are uh, having a very tough time. Ambassador Purushottam, thank you very much for your insight and your perspective on Venezuela. Thank you Thanks very much. So much.